Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise that we have of a better home awaiting in the sky. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet this morning together here on this earth. There are many, Lord, who, who don't have the privilege and the right to meet together, but you have given that to us, and I thank you, Lord, that we are able to come and do it. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for what you have blessed us with. I thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit that can fill us and lead us and guide us every day as we walk with you. But now, Lord, help us to open our hearts and open our minds and, and pour out our worship to you. And I thank you, Lord, for the way that you charge us up just from being together in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to see the bright sunlight coming through? You know what? I want to tell you what. Uh, I know and, and I appreciate your, your clothes and the, the, the what, are, what are those things called? Thank, that's, yeah, those things. Yeah. <laughs> I open them up every week to let the sun shine in. Why do you think that is? It kills the virus. It also feels good. It feels good. But when it comes to Sunday morning, it's all right for us to close them. But, you know, uh, it's, it's good to enjoy God's creation. Haven't we had a blessed uh, summer? It has not been wet. The first uh, year that we moved here, I thought that we were going to have to build an ark. Uh, I praise the Lord for for what he has blessed us with, regardless of what the weather is like, he blesses us every day, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. Uh, just an announcement or two, you'll see in your bulletins um, the regular things, but I want to mention, uh, starting this Wednesday evening, we are starting our children's ministry back up, and uh, we are going to do it out in the pavilion. It starts at 6 o'clock. Actually, we're going to start with the registration with the kids at, at a quarter till 6, and, and we're going to go through the things that we need to do to, to make sure everybody's safe. You know, we're, they need to be wearing their masks and all that kind of stuff, and we're going to take their temperature, scan their little, do the little forehead scan with the thermometers, you know, and, and uh, so, uh, but we have to get started these children need to be learning about Jesus. Now, I will tell you, we're not taking the vans out to pick them up. And why am I telling you all this? Because I want you to pray about it, okay? I want you to pray. We're not going to do activities here and do outreaches out here without the church body being aware and being involved, okay? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't want just a few people to be involved in our outreach. I want this to be an outreach of the whole congregation, Okay, so uh, I, I want you to pray about it, uh, and if you're interested in helping, I would love for you to help. I need you to talk to me uh, or, or to, to Jan uh, after the service. Hey, hey, can I, how can I help? You know, and it's just going to last from 6 to 7. We're asking parents to bring them. We'll see how many of the parents will bring their children, and whoever comes, comes. All right, but I want you to be praying about it. And, and there are kids, uh, last Sunday we, we went out and we did some um, uh, canvassing. I don't know why, yeah, thank you. I don't know why I can't think of certain words, but um, some of you can relate to that, I suppose. Uh, anyways, we, we did some canvassing and uh, saw some of the children that have come here in the past, and they were so excited to see the church van coming along, and we handed to them a little packet with, a, with some candy in it and uh, with some coloring papers, and they were just excited. And uh, I know the kids are anxious to get back, so please be praying about this. Um, we, want, we want to impact their lives with the story and the love of Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay. Um, I, at this point, am not sure of any other announcements uh, than what we have written here, except that uh, we are continuing as the church of God. I'm talking about the, the worldwide church, the people of God. And uh, we want to function as much as we possibly can through this time that seems to be so stormy 
in our history. And I know that the only way to see what God has for us is to continue, to prayerfully continue to live for Him in everything we do. I just want to, uh, as we get ready to, to go to prayer, just want to call your attention to the prayer list on the back of, of the sheet of the bulletin, and let's continue to remember um, the Stewart family, and, uh, and there are several there that, that we have listed. And in, in a few minutes when we go to prayer, I'm going to have you have this sheet in your hand, okay? Our, your prayer sheet. We're going to pray for these people, but it's not going to be in a way we've done it before. So just be, be ready, and uh, let's prepare our hearts now to go to the Lord and just talk to him. <coughs> yes. Sarah Keller, okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right, let's let's sing.
praised the Lord because earlier in the week they had sent a request saying, I'm feeling so, Andy was feeling so depressed. And, and I know that several have, have uh, responded to that. And so now he's saying, it is well. Praise the Lord. But let's, let's pray for it. Praise God. Let's, let's continue to pray for Kaylee. And we are so excited to hear his, his progress. Yes. At the same time. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is that right? You know, God is good. And he is always working. He is always working. Um, remember, Kaylee's family are all traveling back home today. Same thing for some. Chloe and Michelle, some will back to Philly, some will back to South Carolina, some will back to California. So if you could just please remember those travel mercies. You'll remember Katie is... Skylar's biological mother, whom Skylar's now able to be with because of the progress that she has made. And we praise God for that. So let's remember this family as they, have, they were able to come in together and be together yesterday just to celebrate uh, Skylar's birthday. And so uh, let's, let's remember them as they're traveling. That God will continue not only to work in Katie, but in, to work in the lives of all of these people. We, as a congregation have had an impact in their life just because we have been praying for this situation. Isn't it amazing to see how God is working? Praise God. Praise Him. We want to continue to pray. I want you to take your bulletin. I want you to find names of, of people who their first name starts with the same letter that your first name starts with. And if, and if, if your first name starts with a Z, then you better go to your middle name. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Find two or three people on that list that you will pray for this morning during our prayer, during our prayer time. And hopefully everyone there will be, will be uh, covered. I do want you to remember my Aunt Wanda. Uh, she is listed on here. I, I just want to mention of it. Uh, she's... She's been in hospice care for several weeks, but, but she's been doing okay. And now this week, finally, has taken a turn for the worse. And, uh, just remember her and, and, and our family in your prayers. As we're, we're, she is a, a saint of God. And she's ready to pass through those gates. But just like Ed Stewart, it's a hard process for everyone to watch and go through. Francis? Okay. What is his name? 
Connor Richards. Let's remember Connor. He's going through this rough time. Yeah. You know, there's uh, every single one of us has individual needs, and we all know people who have individual needs. How can we ever? I mean, my head wants to explode just thinking about everything that's going on. But you know, it's not too big for God. It's not too much. He knows about every single one of us and every single thing we have going on, and He cares about it. Let's take it to Him right now. Our Father in heaven, we, we come to you once again, giving you praise, giving you glory. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, for caring about us so deeply. We thank you, Lord, for the, for the good news we've heard, the many praises we've heard this morning. We, we praise you for the answers in prayer, Lord. Father, I pray, first of all, that our prayers would never just be... Uh, would just be complacent or, or just be matter of fact that, Lord, that when we would come to you, Lord, we would humble our hearts and we would pray knowing that you answer prayer, knowing that you hear us. Father, now I, I thank you for, for the excitement that uh, was, is seen and, and felt by the rally that was held yesterday, Lord. We pray for our country. We ask, dear Jesus, that you would heal our land Lord, we do not want it, it to go away. We do not want there to be this civil unrest. We do not want to see these, uh, these violent people, Lord, uh, upset our country this way. And so we ask, dear Father, that you would heal our land. Help us to know how to reach out to those who feel disenfranchised, those who feel threatened, Lord, to those who are truly troubled uh, by, by the things in our society that they disagree with. Help us to understand, Lord. But Lord, I pray that you would also protect us from those who have impure motives for all of the stuff that's going on. I ask dear Jesus that, that uh, you would bring the right people into power, Father, that, that our country can be governed in a way uh, that gives you glory, Lord. Lord, we ask that, that you would put an end to all of the terrible things that are happening, Lord. I, Lord, and even right now, as we're thinking about the Supreme Court justice, we ask for your help in this process. Father, if there would be a chance <laughs> that the people on that Supreme Court would have an opportunity to, to eliminate uh, legalized abortion in this country, we ask that you would take care of that. Father, uh, these things that, that matter so much, we, we just submit them to you. But Lord, even as we, we give you this grand concern that we have, we all have our own personal concerns. Lord, we have our list here on this piece of paper that, that talks about the people that we are aware of and we know. And so Father, right now, we pray for these people. Let us lift up the names of those people we identify that with on, on here. And Father, as, even as we speak these names to you and we pray in our hearts, you hear every one of us. Now, Lord, I, I ask that, that even as uh, we have mentioned these, these names, that uh, the, this, this child, Connor, Lord, who, who needs a special touch from you, and this neighbor of Betty's, and, and for Kaylee, Lord, and these, all these that have been mentioned this morning, we lift them specifically to you, Lord, for 
for Skylar's uh, extended family, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to the hearts and minds of all of these people. Help them to know that you are real, that you are alive. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would turn their hearts toward you, that lives would be changed. They would surrender themselves completely and fully. And now, Lord, I ask that you would help us as a church to hear your word this morning, to understand it, to receive it, and to live it, and to show it to others. We praise your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Beautiful job. I know that, well, having been in ministry for all these years, church is something that it's on your calendar. You, you plan on going. You know it starts at at 10.45, so you make sure that that spot in your week is opened, and uh, you plan on getting out, hopefully by 12 o'clock, if the pastor's not too long-winded. It's something that we do. I mean, it's just part of what we do. Yet, it's not supposed to be that way. We, we gather, we come on Sundays uh, because we love to see each other and, and, and we love to, to be with each other, but we, we want to be with each other together praising God. Now that is important and that is the way it's supposed to be because we can worship Him individually on our own uh, throughout the week. We don't have to be together to worship God, but worship for God is, is it's different when we're together. Well, I say all this to, to say that as I prepare weekly, I, uh, I know that, that many of you don't, you don't think about what it would be like to, to come up with a sermon every week. <laughs> I think about that sometime, okay? Uh, if, you, if you're a Sunday school teacher, you, you know what that's like. I have to make sure that you're prepared every week. But... I, I don't want, I don't want you to come and, and just feel like, well, it's time for a sermon, so let's see what he has to say this week. I want to bring to you a word from God. I want for when you to walk out of these doors, for you to say, I heard what the Lord had to say. And I, so often I, I, I have to get out of the way because I, I want... <laughs> Well, now I'm confessing, and I wasn't planning on doing this. I want people to look at me and say, he's a good preacher. I, I'm not a good preacher. There's a lot of guys out there who are fantastic preachers who, who have a way of communicating with you, and by the end of their message, they've got you in the palm of their hand. 
I'm, I can't do that. I, I can't compete with that. I'm, I'm not that kind of person. I'm, I'm just an old farm boy who, who likes a lot of music and, and uh, I like a good story. And I have to ask the Lord, Lord, you didn't ask me to, you didn't ask me to do this to manipulate people. You just wanted me to, to share the gospel, to share the word of God. Lord, what am I going to say? And he says, would you read your Bible? <laughs> get, your, get your message out of there. And, and that's where we've come up with even this whole year. Uh, as, as we began the year, I was struggling. Lord, how am I going to, how am I going to share with, with people through this next year? What do you want? And that's where the stories of Jesus theme has come from. And so I, I decided the whole year we would talk about the stories of Jesus. And so we have been, and, and we got to this point now where even just in this, this fall, breaking it down to the letters from Jesus in the book of Revelation. This is part of our series, the stories of Jesus. I think it's very interesting that the, the letters in the book of Revelation to each individual church has something particular for each church that they needed to hear at that time. And it wasn't just from John, who was their pastor or their circuit preacher. It was from Jesus himself. And he said, write this to this church. And this morning, uh, we're going to be li looking at the letter from Jesus to the church of God in Smyrna. Now, when I say the church of God, you know, that's what we are. We're the, the church of God. We're, we're a non-denominational denomination. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's what we're called. And the reason we have that name, the church of God, is because that's the name that was given the church in the Bible. But I'm not talking about the church of God, Anderson, in here. I'm talking about the church of God in in Smyrna. Now Smyrna, we're going to learn a little bit about Smyrna in a, in a few minutes, but I want you to know that this very message would be easy for us just to gloss over because we don't understand the times, we don't understand exactly what he's talking about. So uh, I would like us to read it, it's in your bulletin, so you have to take that thing back out again, <laughs> and, and it's, it's very short. And, and we're going to read it a couple of, of times this morning because it is very short. But I'd like you to just to kind of read it along with me as, as I read this to you. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Um, we're reading from the New Living Translation for those of you who are watching on, on Facebook and, and, and YouTube. This is the letter to the church in Smyrna. Now remember, uh, John was on the island of Patmos he was exiled there because he had been preaching the gospel. But Jesus appeared to him and said, I want you to write down everything that you see. And the first thing you're going to do is start writing these letters. And he wrote first to Ephesus. We talked about it two weeks ago. And then he, now he's writing to Smyrna. And he says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Now this is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead, but is now alive. And he says, I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. He says, I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. And then he says, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. And then he says this phrase that we have heard Jesus say several times before. Anyone with ears to hear, they must listen to the Spirit. And they need to understand what he is saying to the seven churches. Then he says this statement. Whoever is victorious 
will not be harmed by the second death. Now, I, I want you to, to understand that, that, I mean, we can glean from this just by reading these words, but I think it's important that we understand who the people in Smyrna were and how they had to live, uh, what, the, what the city was like. And so this morning I have a, a short video that introduces the city of Smyrna uh, and, and what it's like even now. So let's, let's watch that. It's, it's, it's from a video called Drive Through History. Next stop on our list, Smyrna. Up just a little bit more. Smyrna, an ancient city now surrounded by the modern Turkish city of Izmir, was originally established around 1000 BC. Greek settlers established Old Smyrna on this small peninsula jutting out into the Aegean Sea. Now it was in Old Smyrna that the famous Greek poet Homer, author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, was born around 850 BC. History tells us that a shrine to Homer stood in the city during the Roman period. After the time of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century BC, New Smyrna was built by the Seleucids along the coast and up these slopes of Mount Pagus. Now this region eventually developed into Asia province during the Roman period and Smyrna, strategically located between Ephesus to the south and Pergamum to the north, developed into a wealthy port city. In fact, it was one of the most important cities of the entire province with a population of nearly 100,000 residents. During the Roman period, ancient historians said that Smyrna was a city of great beauty and impressive architecture that circled Mount Pegasus like a crown. There was a great harbor, a massive agora, and a theater on the northwest mountain slope that could hold 20,000 people. This wealthy city was also known for its exceptionally good wine. Smyrna was severely damaged by an earthquake in 178 AD, but was quickly rebuilt. Now the layout of the city we see here today and most of these structures are pretty much the same as they were in the late first century when John was writing. Here's a portion of John's second letter in the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Revelation 2, 8 through 10. Pretty wealthy city. Uh, the people living there, they, they were able to make a lot of money. At, at this time, when, when uh, Jesus had uh, John write this letter, and, and the church in Smyrna, though, uh, obviously the church was made up of Christians. Well, Smyrna was a nice place to live unless you were a Christian, okay? Because uh, Christians were oppressed and they were looked down upon. They were the rejects of society. Why is that? Because they didn't believe in the pagan gods that the that everybody else believed in. Um, Smyrna was known as a great city of Caesar worship. They had even built a temple for, uh, for the worship of Domitian, who was the current Caesar at that time. The Romans believed that the, the Pax Romana, have you heard that phrase before from, from history? The Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, uh, was embodied and incarnated as a spirit in the emperor. So he was considered a god. 
So during the reign of Domitian, which is when this letter was written, Caesar worship was forced on everyone. It was demanded that, that at least once a year, everyone in the empire must, must burn a pinch of incense to Caesar, saying, Caesar is Lord. Refusal to do this meant that you were disloyal to, to Caesar and to the government. And it was punishable by death. If you wouldn't do it, you could be killed. Uh, if it's discovered that you didn't go to the appropriate temple and burn the incense, then you could be executed. So Christians lived in fear every day of their life because they were a follower of Christ. And as a follower of Christ, they could not go to the altar in a pagan temple and burn just a little bit of incense and mutter the words, Caesar is Lord. Because that would mean that Jesus would not be Lord in their lives. And we know that if Jesus is Lord, there is no one above him. But Satan knows that also. And he wanted to keep as many people from Jesus as possible. Now the problem, one of the big problems the people in Smyrna had, the Christians in Smyrna had, were the Jews. Now the, the, the church, the people in the Christian church in Smyrna were not necessarily Jewish. Now some of them were, uh, because the, the church was started by, by uh, Paul and John and, and the apostles who had come and visited, and there were some Jewish people, and they always started in the synagogue to preach the word of God, because, because in the synagogue people know who God is. And they would start there and explain how Jesus had come as the Messiah and the Savior of the world. But the, this was now some uh, 30 or 40 years later after the church had been started and, and many of the original people uh, had grown older or passed on and there was new people and they were not Jewish people. But the Jews in the city continued to have a, uh, something against them. They didn't want the Christians to be there. They felt like the Christians had taken and, and spoiled their perfect religion and, and the way that they did things. They, because the Christian religion says, uh, the, says look, uh, if you're a Jew, you don't have the whole story. Jesus completes the story that you have been living by all of this time, and, and you need to turn to Jesus. And of course, they didn't want that. And so the Jews were a constant source of agitation for the Christians. They made it their business to make life miserable for them. And they often reported the deeds of the Christians, or the lack of their obedience, like to, to worship Caesar. They often re reported this to the city officials, causing punishment or even death. Now, all of this is a backdrop to this letter that uh, Jesus told John to write. So I want us to, to look at it one more time, and I've asked uh, Pastor Jeff if, if he will help me <clears throat> to read this letter once again. And he is going to read the, uh, he's going to read what you have in front of you, and I'm going to read in between the lines so that we can understand more of what Jesus was talking about. And, and understand why this letter needed to be written to these people. So, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. The letter to the church in Smyrna. Write this letter to the angel or the messenger to the church of Smyrna. This is the message from whom one who is the first and the last. I am, Jesus says, I am there when creation started, and I am there when it ends. Who was dead, but is now alive. I have suffered death, and I have overcome it. I have experienced and understand what you are facing, Jesus says. I know about your suffering. 
I see what's going on here. I've experienced it. I am experiencing it with you. I know about your poverty, but you are rich. Although you're kept from having the best paying jobs because of your love for me, you have much more than material wealth. You understand what the true treasure is in life. It's trusting in me, Jesus. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. The slander being spread that is defaming your character. They say they are Jews. God's chosen people. But they are not, because they are a synagogue belonging to Satan. They are tools of the devil. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. You will be persecuted. You, you have what it takes to endure. The Holy Spirit will strengthen you. I, and I, I just want to stop here. Jesus isn't saying if you are persecuted. He is telling them you will be persecuted. And he said that many times throughout his ministry. Uh, to, and he, would, he told the disciples, you will be persecuted. I want, I want for you right now to say that word, persecuted. Would, persecuted. persecuted. It's not a word we like. It's something we need, we want to avoid. And we don't see it in our country against Christians in the way the rest of the world sees it. But let's, let's go on. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. Now Satan thinks he can make, Satan thinks he can make you break. But you will prove him wrong. You will suffer ten days. It will seem like an eternity, but there will be an end to it. But if you remain faithful, even until facing death. You're doing a great job, Jesus says. You're doing a great job of living for me. Hang in there a little bit longer. Your continued endurance will prove to them that you really have something. I will give you the crown of life. It will be so worth it to you. We will celebrate our victory together forever. I will personally honor you before my Father and all of creation. Anyone with ears to hear, I hope you're listening, must listen to the Spirit. Pay attention to the way the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and understand what He is saying. He will confirm it in your hearts to the churches. Now this isn't just for Smyrna. It's for everyone who hears it. Whoever is victorious, whoever endures to the end, whoever doesn't back down, will not be harmed by the second death will have the everlasting life with me in heaven. This is just a simple paraphrase of what was, what was written. And I, I hope that you don't, I hope that nobody's sitting there, oh, how dare him add to the scripture. No, 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 no. As I, as I read it, I'm just saying, what is Paul or what is John writing here? What is Jesus really saying? I'm just trying to fill it in for you and, and read between the lines. Now, as, as we consider this letter, did you notice that in this letter, compared to the one to the Ephesians a couple weeks ago, Jesus does not say, you're doing this right, but I have this one thing against you. If you look at the seven letters in the first, two chapter, first three chapters of Revelation to the seven churches, in five of those letters to, the, to those churches, Jesus says, you're doing this, but I have this against you. In Ephesus, he says, you've lost your first love. That's what I have against you. But here in Smyrna, he doesn't say, I have this against you. He says, you're doing a good job. Hang in there. You're going to be persecuted. Hang in there. And if you, if you endure to the end, if you endure, I will give you the crown of life. I, to me, thinking about that helps focus the reality of our world. Uh, when we walk out of here today, we, we walk out, in, into, out through the doors into the town of New Martinsville, and we think, okay, I've got to get on. What's for lunch? 
And our reality is confined to what our business is. And our reality is, is confined to what's going on today. We don't think about this big picture. It's, it's just, what, what's, what are we going to do next? But the reality is that there is life after this life. And we need to live this life for that life. There is a reward. And the reward given to us is there because of the way that we live this life and the one we live it with. Does that make sense to you? We've got to keep our head in the reality. The reality. <laughs> and so, I need to introduce to you a man by the name of Polycarp. I'm sure many of you have heard of Polycarp. Have you heard of Polycarp? He's not a fish. Polycarp was a young man who had grown up in the church of Smyrna. He was fortunate enough to, to grow up to become a student of John's. He was born in Smyrna uh, just a few years after Paul had been beheaded, but John was still alive. And John was was uh, one of the pastors, actually the main pastor of, of the church in Smyrna, and he traveled from, from uh, Ephesus to, to Smyrna to, to Pergamum, and just remember we talked about the seven churches. And they went in, in this big horseshoe shape in, in Asia Minor that, uh, to each of the churches. And uh, Polycarp knew John personally. And when he was in his uh, mid to late 20s, perhaps, when John sent this letter to the churches. He grew up knowing Jesus his whole life. He was one of the first to be able to say, I grew up as a Christian. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, every one of us has to accept Christ and ask for forgiveness of his sins. But I grew up as a Christian. Many of you grew up as a Christian. We grew up in a Christian home. We were taught from the very beginning about who Jesus was and, and, and learned to, to love him all through our life. And it has kept us from making many dreadful, uh, sinful mistakes because we were brought up in the way of the Lord. And that was who Polycarp was. He was a faithful Christian, and he became a bishop or a leader of this early church. <clears throat> Excuse me. He lived from A.D. 69, and he died in A.D. 156. Uh, Polycarp was a very famous man in Smyrna, but he was murdered or I should say, martyred by the Romans. His death was very influential, even among the pagans, and his story is widely known and is referred to as the martyrdom of Polycarp. In fact, the martyrdom of Polycarp is a letter written by one of Polycarp's followers. It was written to the church in Smyrna, where Polycarp served as a bishop. Now we have to, I'm, I want to make sure you understand, Polycarp was one of John's students. When, at the time when they received this letter, he was active in the church. And he became, he came to be one of the great church leaders. Many people, after, even after John died, John probably died in, in around 100 AD, uh, after, even after John died, Polycarp continued to minister and became the bishop in the church in Smyrna. This letter uh, is a, an account of Polycarp's martyr, martyrdom for Christ's sake. And it begins by telling about the per persecution and the martyrdom of a number of Christians as well. Uh, it takes place in about, uh, about 156 where it, it starts talking about how, what was going on. 
The Christians uh, uh, here at this time were being told under threat of death they needed to renounce Christ, confess that Caesar is Lord, and offer incense to Caesar. One of the modes of torture and execution of Christians was to have them attacked and killed by wild animals. Now this wasn't just done, take them out in the woods, this was in a public arena. I just want to say, uh, we've been seeing on TV how all the riots take place in the public. There are people who go and they cause such violence and such ruckus in public places. And how crowds can be so out of control. And that's kind of the atmosphere it was when people were living for Jesus. Uh, the crowds were against them. They, they were threatened by people living for Jesus. Because people who are Christians were saying that Jesus is the only way to God the Father, the only way to heaven, the only way to really live, that all other idols, all other gods, are simply false and lead you to hell. And this threatened their way of life. Their whole city was, was built upon worship of all the gods. Their whole economic structure, their whole culture surrounded Caesar worship and the worship of all the gods. And so the Christians had to be dealt with and had to be gotten rid of. So if they would not renounce Christ, they would be taken to the public arena where the people filled the arena and watched the execution of these Christians. After a number of Christians had been killed this way, the crowds began to call for the blood of Polycarp. Because now, as an 86-year-old man, he had been instrumental in helping many, many people to turn away from pagan religions to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was a big part of the reason why so many people were, were uh, devout to God. Polycarp, uh, once this happened, once, once they called for Polycarp to be captured, he wanted to give himself up, but his friends convinced him to try to hide or escape. And so while he was in hiding, he had a vision from the Lord that he was going to be burned at the stake. He was eventually found and, and brought into the city. And as he was being led to the stadium where the crowds were, the captain of the police uh, um, and his father actually were, co were coming, driving by in their carriage, seeing Polycarp being led, walking to the stadium, stopped and said, Polycarp, get up in here. And so because he was the captain of the police, he had rule over the guards who were taking him. And Polycarp got to ride in the carriage with this police captain, as he tried to talk him into to just, what difference does it make if you just say, Caesar's Lord, Jesus is, I mean, you'll get to live. I, I respect you. You're an older man. Will you not just, just do this and keep your life? And then you can just keep going on with what you're doing. But all you got to do is say it to me, and I'll tell everybody. You don't have to let everybody hear it. You just say it to me, and I'll tell everybody that, oh, you did what you needed to do. And Polycarp said, actually, he didn't say anything for a while and they continued to try to to twist his arm and polycarp said i will not deny jesus and so they threw him off the carriage and made him continue to walk towards his execution as polycarp entered into this stadium this this coliseum he heard a voice from heaven saying, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Interesting phrase. Interesting phrase. I haven't, had, I, I, I haven't been able to study where, what that really comes from, but think of that. Play the man. <laughs> Be a man. Maybe that's what it means. Do what you've been called to do. 
And even though no one who uh, saw who said this, there were several people who heard the voice, several other Christians who were there with him, who were probably accompanying the, the crowd that was going into the stadium, probably the ones who wanted to try to see if they could help save Polycarp somehow. Other Christians heard the voice say, be strong, Polycarp, be the man. So as he was brought before the crowd, uh, the crowd saw who he was and they cheered for a long time. They had been calling for his execution. And in front of the crowd, he was brought in front of the, the, the proconsul and, and the proconsul said to him, are you Polycarp? And he said, yes, I am. Well, out of respect for your age, uh, because... 80, 86, he, he didn't want to see him die that way, and he'd lived a long time. This way. They, they had respect for older people. Out of respect for a man your age, I want to give you the opportunity to pledge your allegiance to Caesar. Just say, say, uh, Caesar is Lord, away with the atheist. Now you have to understand that they called Christians atheists because they didn't believe in their God. And so what does Polycarp do? But he looks up to the crowds and he sees this mob who is crying for his death, whose hearts have refused the good news of Jesus Christ. And he looks up to heaven and he waves his hand at this crowd and he says, away with the atheists. Then the magistrate who saw that he was not giving in pressed him hard to say, Deny Jesus. Swear the oath, Caesar is Lord, and I will release you. Deny Christ. Once again, he's asked, and Polycarp yells out, 86 years have I served the Lord Jesus Christ, and he never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme the king who saved me? Realizing that Polycarp would not recant, the proconsul threatened him. Listen, I've got wild beasts ready, and I'll throw you to them if you don't change your mind. Well, let them come, for my purpose is unchangeable, Polycarp says. Well, if the wild beasts don't scare you, then I'll burn you with fire at the stake. Look, Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire, which will burn for about an hour, and then we'll go out. But you are ignorant of the fire of the future judgment of God reserved for the everlasting torment of the ungodly. In other words, look, we've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to be saved from eternal damnation, from eternal fire. You want me to be afraid of a little flame that lasts for about an hour when you're going to burn in hell. I've been trying to tell you about that. No. Then he goes on to say, but why do you delay? Uh, you shall not move me to deny Christ, my Lord and Savior. So the proconsul saw that Polycarp was not going to give in, and he sent out this herald, because it was a large stadium, to announce to everyone, Polycarp has confessed that he is a Christian. As soon as the crowds heard these words, the, the whole multitude of Jews and Gentiles furiously demanded that he be burned alive. And so a crowd went out and gathered the dry wood and piled it into the middle of the stadium. And, and there was a stake driven into the ground that, that he would be attached to. And as they took him and put him next to the stake and were ready to, to nail his hands to the wood so he couldn't be free. He says, he says, leave me as I am. He who gives me strength to endure the fire when it will enable me to remain still within the fire. You understand what he's saying here? Look, you don't have to nail me down to this. I'm not going to run. I've been called to be burnt in the fire here 
for Jesus. And I'm proud to do it. He's going to give me what I need. So that all they did was tie his hands behind his back. And they lit the fire. Well, actually, just as they were about to, to, uh, to light the fire, he prayed his final prayer. And he says, Oh, Father, I thank you that you have called me to this day, to this hour, and have counted me worthy to receive my place among the number of the holy martyrs. This is a privilege, Jesus, for me to die for you. I count it a privilege that I would stand here and go through the persecution, that my body would be consumed by fire because I will not deny you. And at that point, they lit the fire. And the flames quickly caught and rose above his body, above his head. But miraculously, this is, this is an amazing part, he was not burned up. Polycarp was not burned. And those who watched said, he was in the middle of the fire. The fire was all around him, but he didn't burn. Does that sound familiar, like an Old Testament story? Well, this one ends differently, though. It wasn't like his flesh was burning, they said. It didn't, you know, when, when well, you know what it smells like when you burn the roast. <laughs> when when a, a human body is burned, the, the, the smell is, is terrible. But they didn't smell that. I want to quote it here. Uh, it says, it's not as burning flesh, but but it looked as if gold and silver were being refined in the furnace. And we smelled such a sweet aroma as of incense or even the baking of bread. Polycarp's martyrdom was a sweet incense lifted to God. He was the sacrifice at this point. And All of those people witness that. The thing is, he wasn't dying in the fire. Now, the executioner had a job to do to make sure this man died. And the fire wasn't wasn't reacting as it normally did because of the Spirit of God. And so the executioner stabbed him in the chest. And the legend goes, I, I, have it, I, I read several accounts to make sure that it actually said this. And the legend goes, that they stabbed him with a spear and the blood that ran down out of his body extinguished the flames. But he died from the stabbing and then his body was burned up. Have you ever imagined that you would have to face this kind of persecution for being a Christian? Have you ever thought about what it would mean to have to die because you claimed to have Jesus in your heart? We we are very good at trying to help people to become a Christian you know, confess Jesus as Lord and he'll come into your heart and, and he'll wash away all your sins. And, and then we kind of add something to it and it, it's going to change your life. I said that many, many times. It will change your life and it does. It changes your life. But many times we give the perception that when you become a Christian, everything is going to be rosy. Everything is going to be easy. And here in the United States of America, we live in such a wonderful, uh, profiting society. Uh, It's a materialistic society. We have so many things. And, And we consider all the things we have blessings from God. Our, our, our country, I've said it many times, was built on the foundations of the Judeo Christian values. 
built upon Jesus himself. And so we have been blessed. And God promises that if we live, our nation follows him, our nation will be blessed. But now we are crying, Lord, help us to turn back to you. All around the world, even today, people are being persecuted and killed because they are a Christian. And like Polycarp, they do not deny Jesus because of what he has done for him. So I want to come back to my question. Have you ever imagined that you would have to face this kind of persecution for being a Christian? What would you do? You remember um, 20, almost 20 years ago now? I think it was 20 years and... and, uh, the first school shooting in, in Colorado, Cassie Bernal, a young lady who had struggled in her as a teenager, but had come to know Jesus Christ, 17 or 18 years old, and her friends knew that she was a Christian, and it had changed her life. And one of those two very angry boys who were much like this mob of people came with a gun and pointed it in her face. Are you a Christian? She answered, yes, and they shot her dead. Is your relationship with Jesus worth facing brutal death? Do you value your relationship with him that much? That if someone even walked in here today, I'm, I don't want, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to cast disparity and, 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 and create fear, but you know this happens in churches in our country now where someone walks in with a gun. If someone were to walk in here today with a gun and and demand that you deny Christ or die, what would you do? Are you truly that committed to Jesus Christ? That you would say, no, I will not, I will not deny Christ. I will confess him. So they put the gun to your head. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Or perhaps, are you willing to be tortured? We hear, we hear the stories all the time, especially of the Islamic. In the Islamic uh, jihadists who, who come and they torture Christians before they kill them. Are you willing to go through that? Right at this time, God doesn't seem to be calling any of us to do that for him. It's not, it's not what he's calling us to do right now. But he is calling us to do something that sometimes takes just as much courage, and that is to live for him. To live for him. Are you ready to live for him? Can people see that he lives in you? Does your language sound like Jesus? Do do your actions look like Jesus' actions? Do the things that you dwell upon please Jesus? Are you ready for him to return if he would come back right now? Think of that. As we sang this morning, The song, It Is Well With My Soul. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall return. But even so, it's well with my soul. Is that you this morning? Or is there something that you know that you need to take care of? If you're having any uneasy feelings about any of these questions, I'm challenging you to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to figure this out. 
What is it that's between you and me? What's built this wall? Is it a, a relationship with, with someone? Is it, is it a habit I have that, that's keeping me away from you that I, I don't want to give up? Or are you able to say that? Are you able to say that I will serve you, Lord, no matter what happens? No matter what happens. We don't know. We don't know where all of our political unrest is going to go. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes open. Watch and see if at this time the persecution starts to turn towards Christians. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be a later time. But are you ready? This morning, I'd like you to stand together. And as we sing this song, is this your commitment? I will serve you because you've given me life. Let's pray. Father, this morning we, we surrender to you everything that we are, everything that we have, everything about us, Lord. We belong to you. And Lord, when the time comes and we're asked the question, are you a Christian? Lord, we will proudly and with confidence say, yes, I am. Lord, help us. Help us to live up to this. Help us to live for you in every way. Help our actions to proclaim who you are and what you have done for us. Now, Lord, I ask that you would help us and, and fill us with your spirit as we go from this place that we might be able to share your love and your word with the others in this world who are so desperate for you in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's exit one row at a time out the back and we'll see you in the parking lot.